SpaceX CEO Elon Musk is warning that the company could go bankrupt by the end of 2022 if it can't achieve Starship and Starlink milestones that are, by all practical appearances, out of reach because now the Raptor production crisis is much worse than it seemed a few weeks ago, according to Musk himself. What exactly is going on with the production of the SpaceX Raptor? Let's find out in today's episode of Great SpaceX. Now let's get back in on today's content. A few months ago, Starship prototype SN15 touched down on the ground, completing SpaceX's first successful test flight. Years of work led up to this point, and it seemed that the goal of getting to Mars was now a little bit closer. But for the engineers working on Starship, this was just a small step in a very long journey. This week, in a new leaked email, Musk claimed that after key senior management departed the company, SpaceX personnel looked deeper into issues surrounding Raptor production and found them to be far more severe than was reported. Two VPs, one of whom worked on Raptor engine development, was fired due to a lack of progress in the development of Starship's Raptor engine. Up to that point, nothing in Musk's email implies that a Raptor production crisis could pose any serious harm to SpaceX beyond annoying delays. More than two years ago, Musk believed that Raptor version 1.0 already cost less than $1 million to produce. As of 2021, SpaceX, again per Musk, is completing an average of one Raptor engine every two days and currently has 35 functional engines installed on Starship and Super Heavy Booster prototypes in Boca Chica, Texas. Already at a rate of one engine every 48 hours, SpaceX's Raptor production capabilities are theoretically strong enough to fully outfit a significant Starship fleet. But what's really the problem here? As you know, SpaceX is now looking to complete an orbital test flight. This will be a test flight like none other, as a fully stacked Starship will produce almost double the thrust of the Saturn V, the most powerful rocket ever made. In order to produce this amount of thrust, the Super Heavy Booster will have around 30 Raptor engines, lifting Starship's second stage into orbit. In order for this test flight to go well, an enormous amount of engine testing needs to be done. But it is worth mentioning that they will need to rely on an engine that has yet to be flown, the Raptor Vacuum Engine. Importantly, it's difficult to test this kind of engine. Typically, each engine is tested individually at SpaceX's facility in McGregor, Texas before being transported to Boca Chica. From there, the engines are attached to Starship prototypes where they go through a series of static fires or even flights. Known as Raptor Vacuum or RVAC, the engine is almost entirely based on its sea level optimized cousin, taking all of the complex turbo machinery and combustion chambers that represent the bulk of a rocket engine. Things start to diverge below the throat of the combustion chamber, the narrow part of the central hourglass like curve where SpaceX has expanded Raptor's existing Bell nozzle by a factor of five or more. While the optimized Raptor vacuum engine is aiming for a specific impulse of around 380 seconds or 3,700 meters per second, the V1R vac designed to support early Starship development has been made more conservative and is projecting a specific impulse of only 365 to 370 seconds, intentionally decreasing engine performance to obtain test engines sooner. In addition, Raptor Vacuum V1 will have a smaller engine nozzle to avoid flow separation when the engine is fired at sea level atmospheric pressure. The vacuum engines need such large and unwieldy nozzles in order to make them as efficient as possible. In a very simplistic sense, a rocket engine nozzle directs the flow of superheated ultra-fast gases in order to squeeze as much momentum transfer as possible out of available propellant. The lower the pressure of the surrounding atmosphere is, the more those gases will expand immediately after leaving the nozzle. Giant vacuum nozzles simply try to harness the additional momentum available from that extra expansion. This is why rocket exhausts appear to spread and thin out as launch vehicles reach higher and higher altitudes. In this sense, the perfect theoretical vacuum nozzle is quite literally infinitely long. The job of vacuum rocket engineers is to find the perfect balance between that impractical theoretical perfection and the limits of real-world materials and dynamics. In theory, SpaceX's sea-level Raptor engines have already been designed to operate in vacuum conditions, while the engine's closed cycle design and regeneratively cooled nozzle should apply well to a vacuum design. But the real problem comes when it's time to test this kind of engine down on the ground. 
Although it's fine for the exit pressure to be greater than the ambient pressure, if the exit pressure is much lower, the effects could be catastrophic. When this happens, the air starts to push its way into the engine bell, separating the exhaust flow from the walls of the nozzle. If the pressure difference is too much, the engine nozzle could vibrate so intensely that it rips itself apart. This was a problem they had to avoid when designing the space shuttle since its engines had to operate from the ground all the way into space. To get around this, the nozzle was designed as an in-between, allowing it to function in both environments without braking. Outside air pressure would push into the nozzle before the engines could reach maximum power, causing the nozzle to flex due to flow separation. Despite the fact that this appears to be a potentially dangerous situation, the flow separation was never severe enough to damage the engine. However, NASA had to be more inventive in order to test proper vacuum engines. At a NASA facility in Ohio lies the Plum Brook Testing Facility. This is a massive test chamber where the air is sucked out till the pressure approaches that of a full vacuum. When the engine fires, a steam ejector mechanism condenses and extracts the engine exhaust from the chamber, keeping the vacuum intact. For SpaceX, they don't use anything like this. In fact, in order to test the vacuum version of their Merlin engine, they remove the nozzle completely, since testing it with the nozzle at sea level would definitely rip it apart. As for the Raptor engine, it has a much stronger nozzle. But the main thing is that they can run the engine at a much higher chamber pressure. This means that even when the exhaust leaves the end of the nozzle, the pressure is still higher than the air around it. So the ambient air can't get in and cause flow separation. This is a massive advantage since SpaceX can fully test the engine to its limits without relying completely on computer simulations. But most notably, SpaceX has the brightest minds in the country. So with the recent email, Elon is likely just attempting to, for better or worse, instill some amount of fear and panic in SpaceX employees to encourage them to work more hours and take fewer days off. And that's all the information we have for you today. If you enjoy what my team and I are doing and would like to continue supporting us in a huge way, you can become a patron through our Patreon link in the description below. Another way you can show us how much you love us is by giving us a thumbs up if you enjoyed today's episode, subscribing if you haven't already, and hitting the bell so you never miss out on future episodes. Be sure to also tell us what you think about today's content. Everyone's support motivates us to continue delivering quality content and to always improve. And as always, this is Kevin with Great SpaceX, and my team and I will see you next time.